Now, Dr. Ibadi, uh, you have uh, put forward a very powerful plea for the globalization of justice. You put forward a very powerful plea for the globalization of justice. But before we go into that area, I would just like to find out a little bit about how practically it has been for you to really be on the road 365 days a year. How do you practically manage? همونطوری که من As I said at the beginning of my speech the most important thing is to be able to spread information disseminate information we must talk about new ideas and everything that is happening in the world and we can we must discuss that with the people of the world through disseminating our ideas and we have to interact interact and help each other and that is exactly why i am constantly traveling to tell the world that what should be done for non democratic countries I am against military attack. You have seen what happened in Iraq. Over a million people were killed in Iraq. And the situation in Iraq is still far from ideal. I am also against economic sanctions because I think economic sanctions harm the people. So the question arises, that what, we sh what should we do with a non-democratic country that does not abide by any international laws and it's killing its own people and it's violating human rights? What can we do with such governments? For some years now, I have been proposing that instead of imposing economic sanctions, they must impose political sanctions. And fortunately, the European Union took a very good decision. What they did was they put the name of 32 individuals who had who were directly involved in the killing of protesters and they the union eu imposed sanctions on them and they said eu said that these people are not allowed to enter europe and that whatever assets they have in European banks or anywhere in Europe should be seized by the authorities. So thanks to that EU measure, dictators cannot sleep as soundly as they used to. Every dictator has several passports once they are toppled and maybe they will even uh, transfer their funds to other people in other names. Yet it was a good gesture, a gesture that shows that we can make the world smaller for these dictators and make sure that they don't sleep soundly at night. And that is the kind of solution that I seek. To Ibadi, the... Taking 
political action against dictators is, of course, a very good and desirable thing. But the problem is that unless the whole of the world does it together, all that happens is that the political leader concerned goes to the side that will tolerate him, will accept him. Uh, so today, the biggest money launderer in the world is actually the Bank of China. So the issue is, if Europe bans any dictator from coming to Europe, it doesn't stop the person traveling to China, to Africa, to Latin America, to any other country which has dictators. So the world seems to be divided, isn't it, between countries with some attempt to have human rights and countries that have no attempt to have human rights. How do we get this alliance of non-human rights oriented countries to shift? I have to tell you that dictators, which steal a lot of money, who steal a lot of money, don't like going to Africa. They don't like going to South Africa. They like Europe. They like the United States. And that is why we have to block their way to these countries to the West. Do you know many dictators who've gone to New Guinea, for example? But um, so while I totally agree with what you have just said, and I think you're right, but I think the West, Europe, America, Canada, is what remains attractive to these dictators with money. And they send their money to Swiss banks. They send their money to European banks. They don't put money in bank accounts in Nigeria. Therefore, it is very important that the West especially, well, I mean, America, Canada, and the industrial world blocks the access of these dictators to their funds, which has, thank God, started. But I do agree this with you that we must extend this to other countries. And how can we do that? Through us. We are the ones who must go on tour around the world and tell them what is happening and why we want to, such decisions to be adopted against dictators. To come to this summit, I had an 11-hour flight from Brazil just to make it to this summit. I was touring Brazil for work, and before that I was in Mexico, and before that in many other places. So I think each and every one of us could do likewise. If we have an idea we are sure about, we must tour around the world and we must tell the world about our idea. I used to have a professor at university, and he said something to me which I remember. He said, when you don't open a bottle of perfume, you don't know what the scent and how valuable the scent of that perfume is. So it's you have to open that bottle of perfume. So I think if you have something to say, you must travel around the world and say it, or you must write it in books. You must write articles. Or on the internet, yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for wider questions, so please do raise them. I see a hand over here, Gabriella, please. And other hands will no doubt come up. Please, Gabriella. Yeah, no, not working, not on. Okay, thank you. Gabriela Müller, I have a question between uh, Venezuela and Iran. There is a flourishing partnership. Could you just give us your impression on that and what could we expect in the future from that? Venezuela, 
Venezuela is a country just like Iran in its nature. And uh, despite its very rich oil wealth, there are many poor people in Venezuela, as in Iran. In Venezuela also, no one is allowed to criticize Chavez. Chavez and Ahmadinejad are very close friends. And the Iranian government has promised to build an oil refinery for Chavez. So I promise you here that within less than five years, the people in Venezuela, too, will also stage uprisings like people in Syria and the rest of the region. You cannot oppress people forever and expect the people to remain passive. Chavez will also be toppled, to be sure. Uh, I saw some hands at the back earlier, but they're not up at the moment. So can I take Malika first, and then the lady over there, and then Radhika at the back? Malika Sarabhai. Dr. Agati, how much more difficult was your task because you are a woman? That's my first question. And my second question is, do you think that now that countries like Egypt and Tunisia have changed, will the position of women also change for the better? In Iran, people staged a revolution in 1979. And they toppled a dictator which was an American government puppet. But the situation of the Iranian people did not change. One dictator left, and another religious dictator took his place which created even greater problems. I am a professor. I remember something a young student, young male student said to me in one of my lectures. He said to me, we are not free in Iran to even choose to go to hell. What am I supposed to do if I don't want to go to paradise? Because the government, the Islamic government, is forcing us all to go to paradise. This is what happens to a despotic theocracy. In Egypt, there are Islamic radical group. There is the Muslim uh, Brotherhood, which is very strong. And there is a possibility that they may actually come to power. But I doubt very much they will have the same fate as Iran. And I don't think it's going to become as bad as Iran because Because in Iran, the leader of the Islamic Revolution was Khomeini, who was a religious leader. But the Islamic radical groups in Egypt, they are politically orientated. They are not religiously orientated. They're not religious leaders which is why they will not become as powerful as a Muslim leader would become. So I am optimistic about the situation in Egypt. In any case, I think the probability of 
the situation regarding women's rights in Egypt. I don't think women's rights in Egypt is going to be that much affected. Of course, it's possible that But I don't think it's going to be a step back in terms of democracy in Egypt. In a country where there is democracy, ultimately, any discriminatory laws against women would be abolished. abolished. The problem in Iran is that we have no democracy. And uh, Nobody, the government, does not pay attention to the wishes of the people. Impier from Switzerland. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much to be here with us. And my question is, what gives you the, the force to go ahead? When a human being really believes in the path that he or she has chosen, knowing that this path is the correct path, nothing can stop that person. And that person will accept any difficulties on this path. So what is important is to find that path. And once one finds the path, his chosen path, his or her chosen path, that is makes it easy. At the same time, I'm a practicing Muslim, and I do believe in the existence of God, which also gives me this greater strength to resist. The first, and then the gentleman there at the back. Dr. Badi, good evening. Uh, I bring you personal greetings from my mother, for whom you are a big hero. So it is a moment of great truth for her that I am in the same hall as you. My question is linked to the question that my friend now asked. And considering we are a group of people here who are really with the goal of bringing about a change, the theme of the, influence, uh, the, theme of the summit is also to change hearts and minds. What advice would you give us to help us practically be able to get that force from within us to, to bring about that change, to bring about good governance in business, to bring about ethics in business. Thank you. Every person has their own special characteristics and potential. We cannot give guidelines that suit every human being because human beings are different. But in my view, what could be a guideline to everyone is that whatever we don't like to have for ourselves, we must not also like for, for other people. And we must wish the life that we want for ourselves for others as well. And it is, this is I think how we should act. Whatever on the basis of what is good for me should be good for others, and what is bad for me cannot be good for others. Yes, Mrs. Ebadi, I just would want to, I'm Jose del Rio from Chile. Just want to thank you for being here and, um, and for how to be so consequent with your beliefs and your value. I admire you talking about God. And I see we share the same ethic eh, of the three mon monotheistic uh, religions, the Jews, the Christians, and, and uh, uh, Mahoma. But I'm just curious about the thing. Why you didn't mention 
that the biggest democracy between, uh, in the world doesn't want to join the ICC. I refer to the United States of America. Do you have a vision on that or do you have a point? I think if we could, they could be the same as Europe. A lot of dictatorship, especially in my part of the world, would not exist. You are totally right. The United States of America, China, Israel, Iran, and many other countries have not accepted to become members of the ICC, but But it is not just ICC that the U.S. has refused to uh, become a member to. The United States has also refused to be a signatory to many uh, international um, covenants. For example, the co covenant for the rights of the child. Practically all the countries in the world have become a signatory to that, except two. One is Somalia and the other is the United States. At the same time, we must bear in mind that in America, you have a system of two political parties, which makes it difficult for people who are outside the two mainstream parties to compete. Don't think for a minute that America has the most comprehensive democracy. No, that is not the case. Anyone that is outside the two mainstream political systems in America is naturally unable to make his or her voice heard. A uh, question from Pierre Tapier, please. And as we have just eight minutes left, I will get all the questions, if you don't mind, Dr. Ibadi, and then invite you to sum up. Dr. Tapier first. I must write. I'm Th sorry, I've lost my pen. <laughs> just one second. Here we are. Thank you. Please, Dr. Tapier. Yeah, thank you again for this uh, outstanding testimony of courage. A very practical question. There are a number of academics within the room, and uh, as academics, of course, uh, sometimes we are practicing academic cooperation. When we are dealing uh, with a country like Iran, uh, we are often inside the faculty, within the university. We are often divided between a part of the university who think that um, collaborating with Iranian university uh, will sustain the government, in fact, and could be uh, something which will justify the government to stay in power. So it will be rather against the people of Iran. And another part uh, think that Iranian people are highly educated. Well, any, everyone thinks that. Uh, the, the, the strength of the Iranian university is very strong and that uh, collaborating with your university will contribute to sustain that type of civil movement. What should, would be your position? An excellent practical question, but there are others as well, I think. One is there, please. Yep, uh, you have this very compelling vision of a globalized justice. Mm -hmm. Is this a mere wish or dream or can you become more concrete what it entails in a world with very different government systems and so on? What would it mean? Thank you. And um, I think, is that Mr. Badu there? Yes, please. I'm Brice Badu. I'm interested to know how the organizations of the civil society are working in Iran to bring about change. And uh, what kind of relationship do you have with these organizations? Thank you. And uh, Jacob at the back, please. Just wonder if you could 
Could you comment on the two organizations which are quite prominent in Europe and which I always find very suspicious looking at their past track record, you know, and the Iranian opposition. One, of course, are the, the, the royalists and, you know, the son of the Shah who is now being sent around and, and, and feted. And the other, of course, are Rajavi's People's Moedjin. I wonder if you could comment on your experience with them and uh, who are the credible uh, opposition or, uh, groups and their representatives in, in Europe? Any other questions? Good. In that case, Dr. Ibadi, we have just over four minutes. The most, it's very difficult to tell a lawyer not to talk. <laughs> the universities in Iran are all state controlled. Therefore, They are, they follow the government line. For instance, in the past two years, some thousand students were expelled from the Iranian universities because they had criticized the government. Our universities are state controlled. As I said, they are not free. And in my opinion, you must not collaborate with these universities in any way. As for globalization of justice, there are various ways of doing that, of realizing it. One of them is to amend the, in, the uh, International Criminal Court's statute. For instance, amending it to, instead of the United Nations Security Council, which has the right to veto, it should be the uh, United Nations General Assembly that should be able to refer a case to the ICC with the majority of votes. I think that would be a more practical way of doing so. And of course, this is just one of several ways. There are a multitude of ways to uh, globalize justice, but because this is very a very legal and technical matter, and could become very boring, I would not delve into it. Now, regarding the civil societies in Iran, civil institutions, they do exist and they are very strong. There is the student union that is very strong. There is also the labor's uh, union. There is the feminist movement in Iran. They're all very strong and personally, I am in touch with my colleagues in these civil institutes on a daily basis. Um, these civil bodies in Iran have not allowed Iran to date to become like Libya. And at the same time, they are sustaining their protest action to, and they have been successful to such an extent that differences have actually emerged among the Supreme Leader Khamenei and the President Ahmadinejad. The civil uh, bodies in Iran are gradually guiding our society towards democracy. With regards to the monarchists and the mujahideen khalq opposition groups, they are two groups that are against the current government in the country as to 
But there are also the communists who are against. And there are also the religious groups, true religious groups, who are against it. They're feminists and they're nationalists. They're all against the government. There are young people in the country who are against the government. So if you just pick one out of all these groups as the opposition or the leading opposition group, it would not be right. All people are uh, against, all of these groups are against the government. Regarding the record of the monarchists and the Mujahideen Khalq, I prefer that you study that yourself rather than me saying anything. Colleagues, our time is up. May I ask you please to thank Dr. Ibadi very much in my heart. Thank you very much indeed. Very much.